Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending from where you're watching from. And welcome to the second UN System Staff College Coffee Hour. The, this session today is so hosted by the UN System Staff College and the joint UN Program for Women, Natural Resources, Climate and Peace, which is an initiative, a joint initiative of UNEP, UN Women, UNDP, and DPPA. In June this year, this four agency launched the report Gender, Climate and Security, Sustaining Inclusive Peace on the Front Lines of Climate Change, bringing together more than 20 authors to present evidence that gender, climate change and peace and security are indeed inextricably linked. This report has helped to bring gender to the fore in debates and discussions on climate change and security to ensure that as we design solutions to address climate related security risks, we fully integrate the unique experiences, perspectives and capacities of different groups of women and men. Today's discussion will build on this momentum. Our first speaker today will be Mayara Folli, co-founder of the Plataforma SIPO, and will reflect on gender, climate change and security in the Amazon. We will also hear from Colette Benuji, gender and sustainable development expert, Lead Chad Association, who will talk about this, how these issues are playing out in Chad. And finally, Molly Kellogg, who is one of the co-authors of the Gender, Climate and Security Report. And she will leave us with some final recommendations and reflections. Before we start today's session, I would like to remind you of all to turn off your camera and mics throughout the, uh, the webinar, the duration of the webinar. You will have a chance to ask us questions through the chat box at the bottom of our Zoom page. Um, and then before I leave the floor to our first speaker, we would like to ask you some questions and have a bit more of an interaction with, with the participants. So I will launch a poll now. Okay. okay, so I hope you're all seeing the poll from your screens. Right, so the first questions we asked you, there's two questions, you just call the, 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 the metrics. The first one is when you think of the word gender, what comes up to your mind? And we can see from your answers that people answer different things. Women, intersectionality, sex, social construction, equality, orientation, or other meanings even. The second question that we posed to you was when, do you, when you think about climate security, what words come up to your mind? And there was a pool of words that we picked, livelihoods, war, displacement, vulnerabilities, resilience, domestic violence, water scarcity, inclusive peace building, sustainability and others. Now we decided to, um, to use this, uh, this poll um, and, and to provide this uh, wide array of words to give you an idea of the fact that when people talk about gender, about climate security, there's different meanings and understanding. Uh, and we need to be as inclusive as possible in our, uh, in our definitions. So without further ado, um, I will uh, leave the floor to Mayara Foley, uh, who will give you uh, her take on what we mean by gender, climate and security in the context of the Amazon. Uh, Mayara, you may turn on your camera and the floor is yours. Thank you very much and enjoy this webinar. Thank you, Geneva, and thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure for me and Plataforma SIPO to be part of this discussion. So, as being just said, today I'm going to talk about gender, climate and security in Latin America, which most of you must know, it's one of the world's most dangerous regions for women, girls, LGBT people, indigenous women, among other gender groups. The rates of femicide and sexual violence against women in Latin America are higher than anywhere else in the world outside conflict zones. So on top of this already very challenging scenario, you have climate change, which is not only deepening pre-existing gender inequalities in the region, but is also creating new forms 
of risks for Latin Americans. And I'll give you two examples of how this dynamic is taking place at the moment, particularly in rural parts of Latin America, where we know that climate change is, is exacerbating disputes over the use of land, and it's also making it more difficult for many to maintain water and food security. For instance, in the Amazon region specifically, there's growing evidence that climate change is increasing the average water temperatures of rivers and thus limiting the access to fresh water and clean water and also reducing the, the stocks of fish. And of course, this often has a disproportionate impact upon indigenous women, for example, who often depend on river waters to prepare food, to bathe their children, to water their plants and to irrigate their agricultural production. So this was just one example, but a second source of inequality, which is currently being deepened by climate change, is related to unequal access to land and economic opportunities. Only 30% of rural women in Latin America actually own land. And with climate change exacerbating phenomena such as soil erosion and provoking drastic changes in rainfall patterns in a region where 90 90% of agricultural production is rain-fed, it has become ever more clear that women's food and human security will inevitably be put at great risk, especially if we consider the already uh, visible forms of inequality and discrimination that women already face in, in society. So, for instance, just to mention one more number, I promise will be the last one, only 5% of rural women have access to financial and technical assistance to carry out activities such as agriculture and ranching. And it's needless to say with that in light of the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, this situation is very likely to be aggravated and get worse. And I know I've been quite pessimi pessimistic so far, but I'm also glad to say that not always bad news in, in Latin America. We also have plenty of examples of women exercising leadership to both adapt and respond to climate change in the region. For instance, in Brazil, you see more and more indigenous women playing a crucial role in mapping climate change hotspots in the Amazon. And they do that in different ways, uh, including by collecting and sharing information to feed into indigenous climate alert systems which are very innovative and new initiatives which are being built in order to send real-time alerts about illegal activities happening in indigenous lands, such as including uh, illegal mining, illegal logging, and of course, illegal deforestation. And this is just one example in Brazil, but if you go to other countries, if you go to Peru, for example, there are some equally interesting uh, initiatives taking place there. For instance, women, indigenous women again, are, are being able to detect climate, ch climate change impacts based on changing growth and behavior patterns of local plants and animals. And, and with such information, they're being able to create very innovative techniques uh, to adjust to climate change. For instance, some of them are quite simple, such as adjusting planting, planting schedules, but other ones are more robust and include building physical barriers around agriculture pro product, their agricultural production to protect uh, from floodings, for example. But then if you go further north, if you go to Cuba, you'll find female farmers using energy, uh, solar energy, sorry, to activate and manage irrigation systems in a very cost-effective manner. So finally, the, the other point that I would like to stress in terms of women participation in the on the topic is the fact that women especially young women in latin america are increasingly become climate leaders i think we you probably seen last year they were the ones taking the lead in organizing the climate strikes which were present in several uh, regions of over 17 countries in latin america and they are the one leading a broader uh, movement that put pressure in national and local governments to respond and stop the drivers of climate change, including deforestation and carbon emissions. Um, and, and before I finish, uh, I'll certainly have to be 
I've been negative again, sorry, and I stress that despite achieving very tangible results, these initiatives that I mentioned, which are being carried out by women, they often lack in resources, they lack in institutionalization, they often lack in governmental support as well. And, and this shows us that there is a lot more that needs to be done to ensure that gender specific effects of climate security risk in Latin America are incorporated at least in a more systematic way into policy responses. And this is the case not only at the local and national levels, but also at the regional level. So I'll stop uh, here, but I would be very happy to answer any questions that you may have during the Q&A session. Thank you very much, uh, Mayara. And despite uh, what you said about being pessimistic, I think you offered, uh, you offered us some uh, interesting pointers for reflection on actually what can be the entry points for a policy response uh, to, to create more inclusive spaces uh, uh, for women uh, in, in, in a con context of uh, uh, climate change and increased vulnerabilities. Uh, but as well, you also highlighted the important role that uh, women participation as advocates uh, for, for uh, climate change and, and environmental sensitive responses uh, uh, can have. So uh, thank you very much for sharing this result. Uh, I would like to now call on Colette, uh, if she can join us. Uh, Colette had uh, previously some uh, some technical um, uh, issues. So, uh, Colette, can you hear us? Yes, I'm hearing now. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, Colette, the okay. floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, uh, workshop, virtual workshop. Uh, um, to present everyday violence and its impact on this research was a, a collaborative research by Virginie Le Masson, uh, myself and Sandra Sotelo from Oxfam. Uh, we conducted a study in 2017 uh, to explore now how the everyday violence in an adolescent girls living in child affect their capacities to cope with other environment and climate security uh, risks. This was collaboration between the Overseas Development Institute, Lead Child My Organization, Oxfam Intermon, and uh, Concern Worldwide as part of a program called BRESSET founded by the Department for International Development in the UK government. So what is the context and challenge of climate change and security? Child comprise... Can you hear you very much? Uh, Virginie is one of the authors of the study that Colette was mentioning. So Virginie, please, uh, you may turn on your video and, um, and I'm, we're very sorry for Colette. Um, unfortunately, um, her internet connection uh, wasn't very strong today, but uh, Virginie can, can support her. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Geneva. And sorry, everyone, um, this is a recurrent problem um, with, with colleagues. When we try to work, uh, the connection from Chad is just appalling, and it's every, every time a struggle really to, to connect on, on any sort of um, online platforms. But we worked together on the brief that she wanted to present, so I'm just going to read what she had prepared. And uh, this is a, a study that we conducted together um, also with our co-author, um, Sandra. So just to um, say to you that this was a, a study uh, conducted in 2017. We, it's available uh, open access online. And we wanted to use this to highlight how we viewed the linkages between climate change, security, but also domestic violence, because it was so apparent when we started to conduct our research in Chad. Um, we started it by uh, trying to understand how the context of violence uh, might have an impact on people's resilience to better adapt to environmental changes. And it was a, it's a particular context where um, droughts, recurring droughts create uh, an insecurity environment and increase competition over land. And that's just one example of uh, or one cause of violence among many others, including the legacy of years of civil war, 
inadequate governance, absence of a social contract, chronic mistrust of government structures by citizens and a plan to civil service. All of this uh, has created over many years issues such as food insecurity, rising food prices and population displacement, fuel, um, this fuel chronic um, and overall a very high vulnerability profile um, across the country. And so climate change only amplifies uh, the underlying uh, insecurity context in, in, the, in the country. And this is very well documented actually in one of the reports written by Adelphi in 2018. And so insecurity makes adapting to climate change impacts more challenging, particularly when taking a gender perspective to look at the risk of violence uh, faced by women and children. Um, so in a context like Chad, it's about 35% of women uh, who live in a relationship that have reported having suffered from physical, psychological or sexual violence by the spouses at least once in their lifetime. So it's a huge uh, statistics. But our study was trying to bring a more qualitative uh, element to understand how does that look like on a, on a daily basis. And so we uncovered a lot of horrific narratives about violence um, suffered by girls, adolescent girls and women on a daily basis. And what that means is um, consequences that impact on every aspect of people's lives, not just survivors' lives, but also the family members and also on their livelihoods. First of all, early marriage, um, which was the most cited form of violence in interviews conducted in Bar el Gazelle, which is one of the provinces of Chad, this leads to forced pregnancies and results in high health risk for young girls. That also leads to um, food insecurity and malnutrition for infants. And while adolescent girls are more vulnerable to early marriage, we also have adolescent boys who drop out of school because of the context uh, and now at risk of being recruited by non-state armed groups. Uh, second of all, we've got denial of resources, which was one of the most cited uh, form of violence by uh, participants in the study, whereby men's control over decisions and assets not only prevents women from accessing critical health care, but also it hinders uh, collective decision making at the household level to support the well-being of dependents, especially during times of stress. Um, another important aspect is male migration, which, you know, temporary migration is a successful strategy, uh, mostly developed by men to seek new sources of income and improve their conditions. But in contrast, women's mobility is restricted owing to gender norms around men and women's assigned roles in the household, and women stay largely behind. Um, but the majority of uh, participants interviewed were stating that men's mobility is actually having a negative effect uh, on families and community functioning because men do not necessarily bring back new resources due to the overall context of uh, insecurity and also scarcity of resource, but they also simply never come back. So many women explained that their husband remarried or settled elsewhere. Others said that they never heard back from them. And some women revealed that sometimes men would come back without anything and would rely on women's savings. So mothers and daughters who remain need to earn an income to support themselves, uh, which increases their exposure to the risk of violence through sexual exploitation, to the risk of having to give up school or forced marriage to provide the family with an additional source of income or dowry, and to the risk of verbal, physical, or sexual assaults by other members of the household or village in the absence of a protective uh, husband or father. Another uh, example of the connection and the consequences of uh, violence is how sexual violence and attitude and behaviors related to dom domination of women and girls by family members um, that legitimize polygamy and do not tolerate extramarital pregnancy and hold girls and women responsible if they become pregnant outside marriage. All of this have a devastating effect on women's and girls' um, a sense of safety within their community. This further undermines their livelihood, opportunities and capacity to cope in times of stress. Overall, um, and to conclude, um, Experience of early marriage, denial of access and control of our resources, um, and sexual violence, for example, within the household uh, itself, are all examples of gender-based violence that is perpetrated on a daily basis 
not necessarily by combatants. And that's a major um, distinction that we wanted to make with this study is that when talking about climate security, we are not talking about armed groups. We're not talking about uh, wars or conflict. We're talking about everyday sense of safety in one's household. And that impacts negatively on the ability of survivors to secure their livelihoods and to simply uh, cope in times of, of stress. And that's a huge uh, problem in a context like Chad where people have to face uh, a multitude of other uh, pressures on their livelihoods. Uh, I will leave it there, and, uh, but we have many other points for recommendations if anyone is interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Virginie, and uh, sorry for, um, for Colette, but uh, we'll let her in again in the, in the discussion, so perhaps uh, during the Q&A session uh, we may try again uh, how the connection goes. Um, now I would like to leave the floor to Molly, who is um, one of the, or the writers of the report on gender, climate and security, um, for some thoughts and recommendations uh, from, from her end. Uh, Molly, the floor is yours. You may turn on your camera. Molly, I think you're muted. Okay, can you see my presentation okay? Yes, we can see the, your presentation and hear you loudly. Great, thank you. Um, thanks so much, Ginevra, and thanks to Mayara and um, Colette, and as well, Virginie, for those um, really useful insights from two very different parts of the globe, um, albeit facing some similar uh, challenges. So I'm going to trap, try to wrap up the conversation with um, a bit of a summary. And I'm gonna focus on, divide my comments here into three uh, sections. First, I'm gonna talk about what are the key challenges and give, end with a couple of key messages. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about, so what do we do about this? And what are a couple of recommendations that um, came out in the report and have been um, reiterated again and again since and then finally, how do we do this? And, and leave you with a couple of the available resources um, on this topic. Apologies, I'm having some technical difficulties. Okay. So first, the challenge. Um, the challenge has many different dimensions, as you well know, and has been already articulated in the presentations before, but I'm gonna focus on kind of two key points here. And my first point is that um, pre-existing gender norms and power dynamics um, shape the way individuals experience, but also contribute to climate-related security risks. So Mayara uh, clearly uh, spoke about this in her comments about Latin America and explaining sort of the, the, the context without climate change as just by gender inequality and how climate change compounds risks for certain people. Um, but gender is not a, a factor in isolation and to, to, to understand the full picture it is absolutely essential to recognize the ways in which different dimensions of identity, race, ethnicity, religion, age, class, et cetera, intersect with gender to create specific risks um, for specific groups of people. Now, this may seem obvious, um, but this is also in fact where the hard work comes in because it means that simply um, a box ticking exercise that counts how many women are involved in the training on sustainable livelihoods, or how many women are at a local peace negoci negotiation around land or natural resources is not really enough. Um, and this concept of intersectionality was evident in, in absolutely in the presentations that you just heard, but also very much comes to life in the 11 case studies that are presented in the gender, climate and security report. So just to give you a quick example from my own research in, in Freetown, Sierra Leone, 
which is a coastal city that has experienced rapid urbanization in the wake of the Civil War. Um, re residents living in the city's informal settlements, um, which have expanded in, in with, or with rapid urbanization, are absolutely the most exposed to risks from mudslides and floods associated with heavier, harsher storms and rising sea levels from climate change. And at the same time, um, like uh, in Latin America and Chad and elsewhere, um, women in Sierra Leone face high levels of gender inequality, including limited representation in government, lower levels of education or literacy, and very high rates of sexual and gender-based violence. So in informal settlements, like the ones you see pictured on the screen, where poverty intersects with gender inequality, um, poor women tend to find themselves with fewer resources to get out of harm's way. For example, if a disaster is coming, if a, if a storm is coming, or to build back better, to build back their homes after they have been destroyed, and as well exposed to even higher levels of, of violence. And in my own country, it's hard to ignore the images of fires blazing across the western part of the US right now, or hurricanes ripping down the southern coastline. These climate disasters that will only deepen cleavages of inequality. As people leave their homes or they're forced to flee, or in many cases cannot afford to flee, and compound further other crises already faced by communities of color and low-income communities. But my second and perhaps more critical point on, on the theme of not being too pessimistic is that unpacking these nuances can help us not only to minimize risks that are not captured in, for example, a standalone conflict analysis or an environmental assessment, but also to identify opportunities for peace building, for climate action, and for advancing gender equality. And this is clear from the presentations that you've just heard and some of the recommendations and some of the, the good practices we've heard. Um, and similar initiatives are absolutely ongoing as well in Freetown, um, in which women's networks are organizing to make their neighborhoods safer and more resilient. Um, there are plenty of other examples, um, which I won't list now, but happy to, to continue the conversation during the Q&A, um, including those of which I work on at UNAP with the Joint Program for Women, Natural Resources, Climate and Peace, in which um, natural resource management and supporting women's livelihoods through more sustainable natural resource practices has proven to be also a strong entry point to engaging women in local governance, as well as in peace building um, and conflict resolution initiatives. Okay, so we have a big, uh, we've set the stage, but what do we do about it? And I'll quickly mention four recommendations from the report for how to integrate gender into climate security work, um, especially for those of you who are already working on climate security. Um, so the first is to integrate parallel and complementary policy agendas. Um, most obviously the Women, Peace and Security agenda and the growing initiatives on climate change and security. And there are many ways to do this, um, but I'll mention three. Um, first on language, ensuring that gender is fully integrated into resolutions and frameworks around climate security, and that climate likewise is integrated into, and, and, and yeah, integrated into women, peace and security reports and resolutions and national action plans on women, on women, peace and security. Um, second, analysis, ensuring that gender considerations are fully integrated into global and national data analyses on climate change and security, and vice versa, to, to fully integrate climate into analyses on conflict and gender analysis. And third, uh, expertise, um, to make a concerted effort to, to share and exchange expertise um, at all levels. And for example, through joint meetings, briefings, um, with relevant groups that are working on the, the, the different themes. 
And um, so my next recommendation to scale up integrated programming, I mentioned this briefly before, but there's absolutely a growing set of examples where programs address climate security risks from a gender lens and likewise gender equality and women's empowerment programs integrate climate action or peace building goals. But, but these programs tend to remain under-resourced, fragmented and sort of one-off initiatives which brings me to my next point is increased targeted financing. Now we know that only about 4% of development aid money is specifically targets gender equality and um, only about 6% of that 4% is earmarked for um, initiatives like agricultural and rural development. And so it's partially about uh, ensuring that there's sufficient support and funding available for gender specific programming, but also to make, um, to make financing flexible and innovative in a way that allows expertise from multiple different backgrounds to join together in program design and implementation. And finally, expanding the evidence base. So the Gender Climate and Security Report, um, as well as many other papers and um, a slew of research that's ongoing and has been ongoing over the last year or two has been a great start on pulling together the evidence on the gender dimensions of climate related security risks. But um, they've all this research has also helped to point out the gaps and indeed continued investment and in, in research and data is absolutely needed. And finally, so how do we do it and I'll leave you with a list of resources and again I'm happy to uh, to share the presentation if you find it useful but there are some resources available um, already that specifically focus on gender climate and security and I'm sure there are more if you I'm, I'm sure there are more and if you know of additional resources please don't hesitate to uh, mention them in the chat or or mention them during the Q&A but I'll, I'll quickly run through the ones on the screen. And the first is um, the Knowledge Platform on Women, Natural Resources, Climate and Peace. The link is on the screen. Um, and this is a collection of, um, this is a, a growing library of resources on the topic. And there's also a monthly newsletter that's sent out um, with relevant publications, jobs, announcements, events like this one, um, if you're interested in learning more. The second is the policy report, which I've mentioned uh, a couple of times, and that's also on the on the knowledge platform. It's the launch page is embedded in the knowledge platform, and the link is there. And I really encourage you that this publication, um, more than 20 authors came together for it, and uh, it features 11 case studies from across the globe um, with really different conceptions of what security means. Um, really different um, with communities facing really different climate change threats and risks. So I encourage you to kind of to, to read through them, including um, the case study that was presented today from Chad. Um, the, the third is an integrated analysis framework tool, which is um, a work in progress, but available in draft form. And the idea behind this, this tool is um, to provide a set of questions um, that looks at the gender dimensions of climate related security risks that can easily be slotted into or integrated into um, other types of analyses that you may already be doing. Um, and the, the next one is training. Um, there is an in-person training available that uh, we as we as in I am part of the, the Secretariat of the Joint Program for Women, Natural Resources, Climate and Peace at UNOP um, are happy to deliver um, if, if you or your organization is, is looking for um, some guidance on, on programming and analysis. Um, but we're also working on an online training focused on climate change and security and specifically the gender dimensions and that will be available um, starting by the end of the year. And finally, there is a, a growing um, set of expertise around these issues. Um, and there, a couple of them are listed there.
but including uh, a growing community of practice, um, the individuals that you heard today, but also the authors to the report and, and many others. So if you're looking for a sort of specific expertise, please um, know that probably it is out there and, and there's ways to connect. So thanks very much and um, back to you, Ginevra. Thank you very much, uh, Molly, for this uh, presentation. And uh, once more, I think uh, what, uh, what has come really clear from all of your presentations is that despite all the pessimism about the impact of, uh, of uh, climate change uh, and how this is uh, fueling vulnerabilities that uh, then can lead to, to increase violence, there's also opportunities for gender equality, but also for peace building and entry points. And I think this is a very interesting aspect because it leaves uh, us with some room for further thinking and for doing further uh, integrated work uh, on, on, on peace building and uh, climate security. So uh, we, now we can open the floor for the Q&A, but uh, before we do that, uh, we have Mariana Leite, I think, online. Uh, she's the Gender Equality Advisor for Christian Aid in Latin and Central America. Um, so perhaps, uh, perhaps um, you may want to take the floor if you're online. Okay. Um, oh, Molly, you want to... No, okay. So, um, Mariana Lete is not uh, here today. Um, so, let me look at the chat. Uh, we have received a number of, um, of questions, but first I'll ask all the panelists to turn on their cameras. Um, and I will start with some of the... Um, the question that I found most interesting. Um, there's one question that we received uh, that is basically on why is it important to include uh, um, gender considerations in uh, negotiations processes that include, uh, that involve uh, climate security. And it's particularly interesting to me because it will be also the focus of one of our next webinar series. So I don't know if, uh, oh, I see Mariana is, uh, is perhaps online. You want to wave at us if you're online? No, okay. Anyway, so then maybe I, I uh, leave it over to the, the, the panelists to, um, to, to, to discuss. Over to you. Molly, maybe you want to, yeah. Um, sure, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to start, but please, uh, please jump in, fellow panelists, <laughs> or anyone else as well who has um, thoughts on this. But I mean, at its most basic, why why is it important to include women in um, in peace processes around natural resources? I think that there have been several examples um, in these presentations and in the research that show. Um, the the that women's capacities um women's relationships to natural resources and gender norms um across the globe give women a unique perspective and unique capacities um that are often missing from conversations um when they are excluded from um really important negotiations and and decision-making processes around natural resource management and, and peace building. So unique experiences of violence, but also really unique relationships to natural resources um, that, as Mayara showed in her, in her presentation, um, are, are, it's a shame to lose, to lose that knowledge um, when women aren't at the table. Thank you very much. Um, any, Maria, Mayara, do you maybe want to react to this? Yes, and I think I completely agree with what Molly said. I think it's not only about the impacts that those, uh, the conflicts and instability can have in women, which are very different from men. And it's also about the knowledge and experience that they can bring to the, big, the table, precisely because they experience conflicts in, in different ways than men and other 
gender groups do. And if you do not put them on the negotiation table, it's very unlikely that those concerns will be addressed. So it, it's also unlikely that you will achieve a sustainable peace. I think there's plenty of research, research showing that when women uh, meaningfully uh, incorporated into peace process, the chances of achieving a more long-term and sustainable peace are higher. So yeah, just to complement what Molly said. Thank you very much. And on that, actually, tied to that, we received another question on basically um, how do we make sure that uh, in all genders need, so when men and women and other uh, genders um, basically are reflected in the policy and programming uh, phase of, of peace building? Um, is there any guidance and advice you can give us based on your research from the different parts of the world where you've been working? Um, I can perhaps talk a little bit about Latin America and my experience in being part of the procedure to negotiate Brazil National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security, which I think it's a very interesting entry point if we want to address issues related to how climate and, and affect securities of, of different gender groups. I think uh, advancing this agenda is very important in different parts of the world. Sadly, in Latin America, only six countries have national action plan. But I think the plan itself, I don't see it as the end goal. I think the process of building one, it's much more important. And in the case of Brazil, it was very clear that we, we need women and we need youth and we need different groups represented in order to, to have ambitious, but also very specific goals on how to, to move forward. We have uh, a lot of situations in which uh, more, let's say, male-dominated uh, institutions such as the armed forces and police, they were disproportionately represented and the concerns that they were bringing to the table were completely different. So yeah, I think that the Women, Peace and Security agenda can be like a very interesting inter uh, entry point uh, to move this forward. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to add something about this question, if that's okay, Geneva. Um, but to better reflect people's needs, men and women's needs, we need good information. And to have good information, we need data that reflects people's um, experiences better. And so that uh, starts with collecting um, data from different people. And that's why we keep ranting about the need to collect gender disaggregated data, age disaggregated data. Um, and we will keep ranting about it until it's a common practice among not only practitioners, but researchers themselves um, in different sectors, not just the gender studies sector, because then in this sector we're doing it, but because we still work in silo, all the other sectors need to be better at doing this. Um, and once we have this evidence base of, of good information, good data, we can better understand people's experience and better uh, integrate those experiences into uh, uh, implementing program that address the priorities. Thank you very much. Um, one, one snippet on that, um, just to tie it all back, um, absolutely fully agree. And in terms of, I think the, the question also asked about tools and resources, and I know I just went through a bunch quickly, um, but there are um, tools and resources available for how to connect uh, how to collect data that's um, gender responsive and as well climate responsive as well conflict responsive, um, including this, um, this framework um, that, I, that I mentioned. And I'm more than happy to, to share it with the group if you're looking for sort of a guidance, guidance um, on what questions to ask, how to ask your questions, how to create um, um, analyses that are fully integrated and integrate these issues, I'm happy to share it. Thank you very much uh, for uh, you know, reminding us once again of the need to, to, to you know, work jointly for integrated analysis and integrated programming, uh, not just within the UN, but across also partners, uh, non-UN partners and, and uh, local authorities. Um, there is another interesting question um, that uh, you know, might challenge a little bit. Are there any negative impacts of including gender-specific um, resilience building activities and if there are, how can they be circumvented and overcome? Uh, what's your take on that? Over to the panelists. 
I can start. I can see one negative impact is um, the risk of backlash against women, especially if we raise issues of gender-based violence. And that's uh, a, a real risk for short-term projects with a lack of um, continuity and support from established local, often governmental institutions that could protect women and girls. And when these are not existing, then it's really, really difficult from, for projects, for NGOs, for external actors to bring those, um, those gender inequalities issue on the table because the risk of backlash is real and, and, and lethal for, for women and girls. So um, often it's, as, it's being used as a red flag to say, no, no, we're not going to do any gender stuff because it's too dangerous. Um, it shouldn't be an excuse. Um, it's just uh, a, an element to keep in mind to, to rethink of the way interventions are being designed and especially the time frame that is being used. Otherwise, I would argue that there are many more examples of how not using a gender perspective is more harmful than the other way. Thank you very much, uh, Yersuni. Um, any other thoughts on this? Yeah, I think, again, just reinforce what Virginia said. I think I can only think of the issue of backlash, and I think in Latin America it was very clear in the case of the Colombian peace process in which they, they re finally reached an agreement to put a, 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 an end of a decades-long conflict between the government and the FARCs. And when they finally did it, they put that into a referendum. And if you talk to people in Colombia, they, most of them will say that one of the main reasons for people rejecting the agreement initially was because, according to many, they were promoting a gender ideology. In, in, in other words, like putting too much emphasis on gender issues which, which provoked the backlash in that stances. But I do agree with Eugene that we, we need to be careful uh, to make sure that this narrative of fear of backlash does not uh, prevent us from incorporating the needs of, of women and other gender groups. And I think achieving this balancing of being careful, because we know we are living in a conservative movement in many parts of the world, but how, how do we make sure that we, we don't get silenced but that we also address the, the concerns of those who fear a backlash. Thank you very much. And indeed, it's also interesting to see how, um, going back to what Molly was saying about the intersectionality, you know, also doing no harm and, uh, and you know, not creating further vulnerabilities, but actually integrating all these aspects into uh, policy planning and, and programming. Um, there is another question. I think we have a bit more time uh, on the chat. Um, any thoughts on how to ensure that countries can meet to the women, peace and security agenda? It seems to be applicable to country specific situations only um, uh, already on, on the UN Security Council agenda. So I guess the, the question to reframe it a little bit more is um, how can we ensure that um, together with uh, climate change issue, the women, peace and security agenda is mainstream across the, the entire work of the um, of the, the Security Council. It is a tricky question, I know, especially given the current times, but um, I'll, <laughs> I'll let you answer this one. <laughs> Over to you. Okay, I'll jump in again. Uh, I think there's two two things that I would mention. One is the issue of civil society. I think if, if civil society is not pushing, it's very unlikely that this agenda will advance. We see in many countries in Latin America that again, this discussion was majorly dominated by security oriented uh, ministries and, and bodies other than more socially oriented and human rights oriented uh, ministries, for instance, in the government. And I think a lot of it was because civil society is not often not engaged with the agenda. Uh, a lot of people don't know about it, uh, especially in countries which are not affected directly by conflict, such as the case of Brazil. So making sure that we communicate this agenda better to the, the broader public, I think is the one way of doing it. And I think for countries which are not, again, not in situations of conflict necessary, we need to make sure that national action plans on the women's peace and security agenda reflect the internal realities and have targets to improve uh, what's going on in their own countries. We see, especially in developed countries, that they tend to address the women's peace and security from when they are 
uh, providing aid or cooperation externally, but they don't face what, the, what are the challenges they are, they are going through internally. So I think it's very important both to have civil society engaged, but also make sure the NAPs do re reflect the reality of countries internally and not only what they do abroad. Thank you very much. Any other reactions? Okay. I didn't see. Oh, yes, Molly. <laughs> I'll, I'll say one thing from the global level um, in, in how do you actually get, I mean, right now we sort of have two parallel agendas, if you will, um, developing one around climate change and security and one around women, peace and security. Um, and there are good reasons for this. I'm not saying they're not. Um, but I think that there's plenty that we can do to ensure that we don't continue to, si to silo um, these two different issues um, within our own spaces. Um, and things like, um, again, having joint meetings, joint briefings, there's loads of expertise now from the UN side um, that are deployed around the world that have specific gender expertise and or specific climate or security expertise and physically bringing those people together to work on common plans and strategies um, is, is one way to make sure that sort of climate realities are reflected in the women, peace and security agenda and vice versa. Thank you very much, Molly. Other reactions from the panelists? Okay, so I think uh, I see no other reactions. So I think this brings us to a close um, of our uh, webinar. Um, and, you know, we started with uh, Mayara's presentation, who, you know, started saying I'm a pessimist. Uh, but I think, you know, we can also end on a happy note. Uh, uh, according, you know, Madeleine Albright, who said, you know, I'm not a, a op I'm an optimist, but I do worry a lot. And in that vein, I think um, we could also use some of your suggestions and your recommendations on the need to look for entry points uh, for, uh, you know, greater inclusivity and as well uh, taking the points uh, from, from Virginie uh, and the suggestions of, of how we can look at the issue in a sort of more integrated manner. Um, the need to look at the intersectionality of uh, gender and climate security in all of our work and uh, uh, within the UN, but also working with, uh, with uh, regional and non-regional partners. Um, and so uh, I hope you have enjoyed uh, this, this webinar. If you have questions, of course, you're most welcome to write uh, to peace and, and security at unicc.org. Next week, we have another uh, webinar which will concentrate on migration, displacement and climate security. Uh, we will hear a presentation from Adelphi, uh, from UNHCR and IOTM on, on this issue using a sustaining peace uh, framework. So we'll hear what they have to say about that. Um, also, some of these issues will be tackled uh, on, uh, in, in a training that uh, the UN System South College is preparing with, together with Adelphi for the months of November. So you may wish to check our website. Um, and uh, we hope uh, you know you will sign up to our next webinars on, our, on the UN System Staff College uh, website or Berlin Climate Security Conference website. Um, all our, our webinar series start at 3 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, this is Rome time, 9 a.m. New York time. Thank you very much for following us and for your questions and uh, all the very best uh, for your important work. Thank you very much. <laughs>